Video games have never been more popular than they are now, but they've also never been more similar. In fact, the industry is pretty much the equivalent of that can I copy your homework meme from a few years ago, and yeah, I might be showing my age with that one. However, this doesn't necessarily mean that all new games are bad or unimaginative, but that you can usually tell when a certain feature will show up in a new release based purely on its genre. That can make games more accessible and help players jump into them quicker without having any barrier for entry, but it can also breed familiarity, especially when certain cliches are included seemingly to just tick a marketing box. These features might once have been unique and innovative, but now they're nothing but cliches that stop games from being as creative as they could be. I'm Josh from WhatCulture.com, and these are 10 video game cliches that need to die. Number 10 the father-daughter bond. The Last of Us, The Witcher 3, and Bioshock Infinite are some of the best games of the last decade. Yes, even the last one I mentioned there, partly because they all focus on the central relationship between a father figure and a daughter figure, chronicling how they both grow in the face of adversity. The problem is, they ruined it for any other action game that wanted to tell a similar tale. That's because in the early 2000s, there was a period where a bunch of big name games all told this story at the same time, and did it better than anyone expected by tying the companion in the narrative to the gameplay in a dynamic and inventive way. And it's made similar efforts which followed feel a little bit hollow. Even if they're not chasing trends and are trying to make something good, using this relationship as the emotional backbone of a story is no longer unique, especially when so many titles often give the companion character identical abilities in the gameplay. Number 9. These same four zombie enemy types. At one point, this entry was simply going to be about zombies in general, but really it isn't the creatures themselves that are boring and outdated, otherwise they wouldn't have persevered in media for decades, but rather how developers use them in video games. Take Days Gone for instance, a game I talk about over and over again to the enjoyment of nobody. This was a zombie apocalypse game that the devs were constantly trying to push as being unique and separate from the thousands which came before it. Here, the undead were known as Freakers, and there was genuinely enough to distinguish them from regular old shamblers, including a fascinating origin, a genuinely inspired ecology, and the fact that they were constantly mutating into new forms. What made all that set dressing kinda useless though, was the fact that the behaviour of the enemies conformed to the same old zombie types we fought against time and time again. There were the regular brainless fodder, the tank strong zombie, and the fast agile one that jumped around a bit. All that was missing really was the bloated one that would spit and blow up. These templates have been the basis for sub-bosses even outside of zombie fiction, and it's overdone, it's just kind of redundant now, and they have no right showing up in a zombie game ever, ever again. Number 8. Craft everything all the damn time. I don't exactly know how crafting became a feature that had to be included in every single game regardless of genre, but that's the reality we live in now. There was once novelty in a system where you could collect scrap to make new things, and it still does make sense in post-apocalyptic games like The Last of Us or Fallout, where scavenging and concocting life-saving items from garbage makes in-world sense, but that context is now seemingly unimportant. Because it doesn't matter what kind of game you're playing, it will probably feature some kind of workbench where you can turn scrap into health packs like a rag and bone Jesus. It's a mechanic that, like a lot on this list, isn't bad per se, it's just so familiar that you probably don't even question whether it's actually any fun to use, which is what we're here for in the first place. Number 7. The Princess is in Another Castle Structure Games are inspired by cinematic storytelling devices, but the length of any given title, even the shorter ones, is often way longer than a film, and writers and designers have had to come up with ways of elongating the experience without muddying or changing the central objective. Nintendo's Mario franchise infamously used the Princesses in Another Castle trick, where players would make it through levels to rescue Princess Peach, only to realise at the end that they'd been barking up the wrong tree and needed to investigate another the area. 
Now, obviously, it's not always literally a princess players are looking for, and it's not always a castle they're exploring. But the general idea of having these roadblocks and extensions placed onto the plot to pad the runtime has never really vanished. Games have gotten better at hiding this formula, but you can still identify when it's being used. Number 6. The Color Coordinated Loot System for better or worse, pretty much every action game has looter shooter elements now. Weapons are no longer things to find and cherish, but numbers on a page that should be swapped out after every combat encounter, with the gameplay loop being designed around the pursuit of the top level death bringers. And that's fine, but the big issue is that the majority of games don't do anything to differentiate their loot system from the next big blockbuster. Modern shooters especially rely heavily on the same basic tiered system of common, uncommon, rare, epic and legendary weapons to get them through, while they'll often even share the same colour coordinated hierarchy. Players know a grey gun is a dime a dozen, a green one is a little bit better, a blue one is getting into rare territory, and purple and gold are the upper levels. It's made these loot shooters all about seeing explosions of colours pop, rather than the actual weapons or how they function. Number 5. Stealth equals squatting in tall grass it makes sense for video games to simplify things to make them fun. Scoring an overhead kick from outside the box isn't as easy as it is in FIFA, while infiltrating a Nazi-occupied castle with only a handful of throwing knives isn't as effortless as it is in Wolfenstein, or at least so I've been told. However, sometimes games go too far and implement a system that clearly should have evolved by now, yet which has remained static. Take stealth, for instance, which in a bunch of games simply amounts to sitting around in some tall grass, your head peeking out of the top, while brainless guards walk straight past you. Sure, it's easier than making sure you're well and truly hit and camouflage correctly, but that doesn't mean it's fun. Often, stealth is so basic that it makes you wonder why the devs included it at all, especially when the only cover they know how to render is a goddamn bush. Number 4. Losing all your abilities after the first level. This one thankfully isn't as prevalent as it used to be, but it still shows up far too often for my liking. The general idea is that a game's opening needs to hook the player across the first few hours, and that often means devs show off all the cool abilities and weapons they've built straight away. The problem is, of course, you can't start out players at the peak of their powers, as they need to feel like they're getting stronger and growing over the course of the story, which usually leads devs down the path of stripping these abilities away after the opening and then forcing players to recapture them. The first Assassin's Creed took a lot of criticism for doing this at the time, and while that title is perhaps the most egregious example, releases continue to make this mistake over a decade later. Number 3. Mentors Betraying Students A lot of the entries on this list so far have been about gameplay elements, but there are narrative conventions that game stories return to far too frequently as well. One is giving the player character a mentor figure to look up to, who teaches them the basics and then inspires them to embark on a quest. Of course, 9 times out of 10, these characters almost always betray you by the time the story is over. Sometimes these heel turns are obvious from the beginning. After all, it doesn't matter whether you're his secret apprentice or not, you probably shouldn't put your faith in Darth Vader. But other times, you can guess how the relationship is going to change purely because of how games have handled the dynamic in the past. Like all cliches, games can do this well, and Metal Gear Solid 3 is probably the be-all and end-all when it comes to maximising the dramatic potential of this trope. But for every MGS3, there's 10 releases that absolutely half arse it. And as my friend Ron Swanson once told me, never half ass anything when you can full ass something else. Number 2. Highlighted Climbable Areas The issue that faces developers when they put climbing mechanics into their games is that, unless they're making Breath of the Wild, not everything can be climbed. Consequently, they need to find a way to communicate to players what can be traversed and what's just set dressing, and that usually results in every climbable ledge having a visual signifier of some kind, whether that's a yellow painted outline in Tomb Raider, or simply highlighting ledges a different shade from the environment they're attached to in Uncharted. There obviously needs to be some way to identify interactive areas, but it can make the game world feel more artificial than it should. I mean, after all, who was leaving behind hundreds of ropes in Far Cry 4? 
I must say though, God of War recently did a great job of justifying why certain areas were highlighted, so hopefully devs get more inventive with this in the future. Number 1. Detective Vision slash Eagle Eye Modes when Arkham Asylum pioneered the use of Batman's detective vision and Assassin's Creed introduced the Eagle Eye ability, how players read a game's world changed forever. While minimaps used to be the primary way of conveying environmental information such as key items or enemies, now those things would be highlighted in real time. While a handy little effect altered the game's visual presentation for even more clarity. Again, it's one of those abilities that works best in games that justify it, and falls flat in titles that throw it in because it's just expected. Even The Last of Us has a listen mode that highlights enemies through walls for easier combat, but the game is much more intense with it turned off, and the higher difficulties remove it by default. Options are always a good thing, don't get me wrong, but games relying on modes like this to convey every bit of info to the player makes navigating each one feel so run-of-the-mill and kinda ugly. So that's our list. I want to know what you guys think down in the comments below. Are there any cliches I missed off here? And do you even agree with the ones I've got on this list? Either way, while you're down there, could you give us a like, share, subscribe, and head over to whatculture.com for more lists and news like this every single day. Even if you don't, though, I've been Josh. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you soon.